Tonight, tragic discovery. Brazil says debris from flight 447 has been found in the Atlantic. For anxious relatives, reality is setting in. Maybe today I'm realizing he might, might not come back. <laughs> I'm Katie Couric. Also tonight on Capitol Hill, judging the judge. Sales are up at Ford, but can it avoid the road that led the competition to bankruptcy? And they're back, the food police, blowing the whistle on the worst of the calorie-busting, artery-clogging restaurant menus. This is the CBS Evening News with Katie Couric. Good evening, everyone. When Air France Flight 447 vanished over the Atlantic Sunday night, there was the slimmest of hope that somehow the passengers might have beaten the odds and survived. But late today, Brazil's military said debris found hundreds of miles offshore confirms the Airbus A330 crashed into the sea. Brazilian Navy ships are headed to the area tomorrow. The French are sending submarines, and a U.S. spy plane will also join the recovery effort. More now from Mark Phillips in Paris. The search planes have been hampered by the same rough weather suspected of having a bearing on the crash. French planes from West Africa joining the Brazilian Air Force, combing the vast Atlantic, hoping against hope to find survivors. But instead, the Brazilians found wreckage about 600 miles off the South American coast. An airplane seat, some metal pieces, a life jacket, a fuel slick. Significantly, the debris was found in two separate areas about 35 miles apart and off the plane's assumed flight path, indicating that the plane may have broken up at high altitude and that the pilot may have tried to turn to avoid severe thunderstorms or to head back to the coast. If there was some sort of a catastrophic event on the airplane and the airplane broke up as it was coming down, the debris field would be very large. Whatever happened, it happened in the zone of extreme weather known as the Intertropical Convergence Zone, where prevailing winds from the north and south hemispheres meet, causing violent thunderheads that can reach up beyond 50,000 feet, higher than commercial planes can fly. No explanation, though, will give solace to the relatives and friends of the victims. I'm realizing he might, might not come back. <laughs> but uh, I kept phoning him on his mobile. Patricia Coakley's husband, Arthur, was on the flight. Yesterday it was rigging, so maybe they're not at the bottom of the sea. That's my hope. The shock is just unbearable, to be honest. Anya Rooney. A friend of Irish dancer Ethna Walls. Everybody is just absolutely demented. Nobody knows what's happening, and it's frightening, to be honest. It really is frightening. Two of the three Americans on board have now been named as Anne and Michael Harris of Lafayette, Louisiana. So the mystery of where this plane seems to have come down has now been resolved. The mystery of why remains. Katie. Mark Phillips with the latest from Paris tonight. Thanks very much. Now to Washington and Supreme Court nominee Sonia Sotomayor. Her road to confirmation runs through Capitol Hill and she was met there today or she was there today to meet with senators who will be voting on her nomination. With so much talk about Judge Sotomayor's background, her message today was the law is more important. Here's Wyatt Andrews. The judge with the toughest nails reputation brought a smile, a Hollywood style arrival, and even some baseball small talk. I root for the home team. As she essentially began her campaign for confirmation, Judge Sonia Sotomayor visited 10 senators but brought one message the questions about her record, including her comment that a wise Latino woman might reach a better conclusion than a white male were answered with a seemingly scripted phrase, a phrase quoted by Judiciary Chairman Pat Leahy. She used those words, ultimately and completely, as a judge, you follow the law. And she repeated that line, as a judge, you follow the law, to both Democrats and Republicans. Yes, she used those words. Um, and of course, the question is, what is the law? 
how, do, how does a judge find the law? Republicans are under intense pressure to be tougher on Sotomayor, to force what 145 conservatives said in this letter should be a great debate over judicial philosophy. Republicans do plan to slow things down, take their time to comb the judge's record, and are dismissing the president's request for a vote by early August. We've got until October uh, 7th, I believe, or 5th, uh, to, uh, uh, for the nominee to take office. At least twice, the judge was asked about charges she is a racist. Has called you a racist. And while tempted to answer, she visibly held back. <laughs> Senate Republicans have decided they won't be using the charge of racism. They may plan to delay things, but all of them today promise the hearings will be respectful. Katie? Wyatt Andrews reporting from Washington tonight. Thanks. To the economy now, with the recession and the auto industry meltdown, President Obama sent members of his economic team out to four hard-hit states today to reassure workers they haven't been forgotten and help is on the way. But as Dean Reynolds reports, they were met in some cases with skepticism. Biggest. Administration officials tried to comfort communities ravaged by the collapsing car industry. The White House car czar was in Michigan, where 8,600 workers just found out their jobs are going away. We want to not only return those industries to health, but we're committed to creating new jobs, new manufacturing jobs. In car industry dependent Fort Wayne, Indiana, where the unemployment rate is 11 percent, Energy Secretary Stephen Chu said the administration feels their pain. We also are very keenly aware of the distressed state of the United States economy, uh, the distressed state uh, in this region. In Indianapolis, Agriculture Secretary Tom Vilsack stressed a central point of the Obama presidency, that jobs lost in one industry can be found in another. An economy that's uh, moving away from the notions of pollution and waste towards an economy that's built on green jobs and clean energy. In April, Vice President Biden toured a Chicago plant resurrected from bankruptcy by a company making energy efficient windows. Now business is coming back to the plant thanks to incentives built into the administration's Recovery Act, which encourage energy efficiency. But new alternative technologies have been hurt by the same economic downturn that's sapping old school manufacturing. And there's abundant skepticism about new jobs materializing. We tend to have been told for so many years that this is going to happen. And unfortunately, there's times when, well, way too many times when it just didn't pan out. For the shell-shocked Midwest, talk without results is just more hot air. Dean Reynolds, CBS News, Chicago. And GM announced today it's selling the Hummer SUV brand to a Chinese manufacturer, saving more than 3,000 American jobs. The deal calls for Hummers to be built in the U.S. at least through the end of next year. Meanwhile, the automakers released their May, May sales figures today. They show some improvement, especially for Ford. As Anthony Mason reports, Ford is capitalizing on the troubles faced by Chrysler and GM. When Mary Collette went shopping for a new car, she had bankruptcy on her mind. Ford is the only one of the big three that didn't need any bailout money. And uh, so that was important. Congratulations. Thank you. And that's what she bought, a Ford Escape. I would like to have my warranty work done here at Best Ford rather than at the White House. With its rivals in the big three in bankruptcy, Ford is stealing business and market share. Sales were up 20% in May from the previous month, but they're still down more than 24% from a year ago. And the company doesn't expect to become profitable again until 2011. Ford has so far steered away from Chapter 11 because it borrowed billions before the financial markets collapsed. But it's still burning through cash, $3.7 billion in the first three months of this year better than last year, but at that rate, analysts say, within 12 months. They'll definitely be running uh, running out of capital, and I don't think that uh, the capital markets are, are real favorable to car companies these days, so the only place they could turn at that point would be the government. Meanwhile, the new government-owned GM is launching an ad campaign to show it's reinvented itself. Because the only chapter we're focused on is chapter one. But there's no roadmap to profit for any of the big three if sales remain stuck in their worst slump in decades. They may emerge, you know, leaner, meaner, more competitive, but car sales have got to pick up because at this level, it's, it's just, uh, it's a disaster. 
One bright spot in the May numbers, Chrysler sales jumped more than 20 percent from April. GMs were up 18 percent, proving that bankruptcy is not the kiss of death for car sales. Katie? Anthony Mason. Anthony, thank you. And meanwhile, there was some fence mending at the White House today during a touching ceremony that merged the past with the present. Wearing her favorite color, former First Lady Nancy Reagan returned, escorted into the diplomatic reception room by President Obama. Their relationship had gotten off to a bumpy start last November when he made a joking yeah, reference to her to and seances. And she recently criticized him for not using her to promote his new stem cell policy. Mrs. Reagan, who turns 88 next month, walks with a cane now after breaking her pelvis last autumn. The president announced plans to mark the Ronald Reagan centennial. This legislation, approved by an overwhelming bipartisan majority in the House of Representatives and passed unanimously in the Senate, will create a commission to honor President Reagan on the 100th anniversary of his birth. Then, as the president signed the bill, Mrs. Reagan made an observation that brought chuckles from the audience. Hi. In case there's any question, they were talking about his hand, not his wing. Penmanship, not politics. Well, thank you. And coming up next, how does a defense contractor qualify as a charity? It's all about location and your tax dollars. Cheryl Atkinson follows the money. CBS News has learned the FBI is investigating the little-known charity called Commonwealth Research Institute. It's located, like a lot of Congressman John Murtha's pet projects, in his hometown, Johnstown, Pennsylvania. Commonwealth gets the same benefits as the Salvation Army or any other charity. It doesn't have to pay taxes, but you might find its line of work surprising. It's a defense contractor. It certainly raises a question. Dean Zerbe was a really top question. Senate investigator. He questions Commonwealth's tax-exempt status, saying it seems to do business just like any for-profit defense contractor. There's a lot of tests to being a charity and just saying, well, I'm doing research paid for by the government. If that were the test, I'd have 10,000 companies I could line up tomorrow that would be a charity. If Commonwealth were not a charity, it could owe roughly one-third of its profits in taxes. That could add up to millions on more than $45 million in government contracts, but it pays nothing. Documents show when Commonwealth was formed, company officials touted their connections to the local congressman, Murtha. The IRS had its own questions as to why the company deserved tax-exempt status. Commonwealth promised to serve the public by publishing most of their research. But nine years later, they haven't published a single word. Murtha's hometown, far from Washington, is an unlikely hub for defense contractors like Commonwealth. But they're here because it's Murtha's town, and he has influence over which companies receive billions of tax dollars. Commonwealth Research gets all of its funding from government contracts. As for what taxpayers get in return, it's hard to say. Commonwealth doesn't have a website and won't even tell us how many people work there or how they've spent millions of tax dollars. We went to Commonwealth's headquarters looking for answers. We barely parked before a security guard blocked us. This building, sir, is funded by taxpayer money. I'm going to ask you to get in your car and leave. A Commonwealth spokesman told CBS News they have a track record of providing significant value to the military and that all of their work, including a government contract under investigation worth up to $45 million, is classified. The Pentagon wouldn't confirm that. Commonwealth's parent company is another charity, Concurrent Technologies. With help from Murtha and a lobby firm that's under FBI scrutiny, Concurrent has gotten a billion dollars in defense contracts and earmarks. At his recent showcase for defense contractors in Johnstown, Murtha was asked about investigations involving firms he's tied to. What, what do you think? I'm supposed to oversee these companies? That's the Defense Department's job. That's not my job. Okay, well, I'm just you guys write these stories. You don't have a clue what this is all about. There's no evidence Murtha profited from any of these businesses, but critics question how he used his influence to get them so many of your tax dollars. Cheryl Atkinson, CBS News, Johnstown, Pennsylvania. 
Now to the shooting death of George Tiller, a doctor who performed late-term abortions. In Wichita, Kansas today, 51-year-old Scott Roeder was charged with first-degree murder. He appeared in court by way of a video hookup from jail. Dr. Tiller was gunned down Sunday in a Wichita church. Still ahead, President Obama reaches out to the Muslim world. Al-Qaeda's number two said today President Obama is not welcome in Egypt. Just the same, the president will deliver a major address there on Thursday. It's the second stop on a trip that begins tonight in Saudi Arabia and includes visits to Germany and France. Lara Logan is in Cairo with more on the president's attempt to reach out to Muslims. Sunset in Cairo. The call to prayer rings out. Thousands fill the mosques for Friday prayers. Muslims around the world are paying close attention to the overtures made by Barack Obama from his first moments as president. To the Muslim world, we seek a new way forward based on mutual interest and mutual respect. That way forward begins in Egypt. This is the first time that American president comes to a Muslim capital and wants to deliver a speech a speech of reconciliation with the Muslim world. About 20 million people live here at the ancient crossroads of Cairo. It's the intellectual center of the Arab world. The heartland of Islam is here in the Middle East, even though Arab countries make up only about 20% of the world's Muslims. Cairo was a natural choice for President Obama's speech because it's at the heart of the Arab world. And although he'll be speaking to Muslims in general, when it comes to U.S. strategic interests, it's the Arab countries that are the most critical. The main problems between the American administration and the Muslim world are Arab problems. Problems like the Palestinian problem, the Iraq problem, and so on. Egypt's location has always made it critical to stability in the Middle East. Nestled below Israel and Jordan, a neighbor to Saudi Arabia and Libya, the Suez Canal at its northern tip, where 30 percent of the world's oil passes every year. It receives over $1.5 billion a year in U.S. aid, second only to Israel, with whom it has fought four wars. Then in 1978, the tide changed. Egyptian President Anwar Sadat became the first Arab leader to recognize and visit the Jewish state. He engaged Israeli Prime Minister Menachem Begin and signed a peace treaty with Israel the following year. Two years later, anger at Sadat's outreach to Israel boiled over. Militants assassinated him. Vice President Hosni Mubarak took control. Throughout his 28-year reign, a wary Mubarak maintained peace with Israel and good relations with the U.S. But many in Egypt feel his leadership cost his people dearly. Today, over 40 percent of Egyptians live in poverty. A bigger problem for President Obama, Mubarak's Egypt is seen by many as an oppressive police state. That's the Egypt the world saw on Election Day in December 2005. Police blockaded polling stations, beating back people they feared would vote against the ruling party. Ayman Noor finished a distant second to President Mubarak, but the regime felt threatened by his popularity, so they threw him in jail for three years. I dream that my children and grandchildren will someday have a free country, he told us. Noor is one of many here who are concerned President Obama's presence endorses Mubarak's oppressive rule. I fear that by speaking here, he is supporting a tyrannical regime with a bad human rights record, he said. I hope Obama works towards change here. America's new leader has raised the hopes of Muslims all over the world, who now expect so much of one man. Lara Logan, CBS News, Cairo. Finally tonight, the uncomfortable truth about comfort food. A lot of restaurant meals have way too much fat, salt, and calories. And according to a new report from the food police, it's getting worse. Here's Ben Tracy. We may be downsizing on dining out, but some restaurants are still supersizing their menus. Yeah, because everything tastes better fried. <laughs> or with cheese. 
but start your meal with Red Lobster's Ultimate Fondue and 1,500 calories and two days worth of saturated fat will melt in your mouth. It's just one of nine menu items from chain restaurants listed on this year's Extreme Eating Report. They're super fatty, they're super salty, and the portions are oversized. Take Chili's Big Mouth Bites, four mini bacon cheeseburgers, but with a total of nearly 1,600 calories, 28 grams of saturated fat, and two days worth of sodium, each so-called bite is like eating an entire McDonald's quarter pounder. By going to these restaurants, literally I have gained close to about 200 pounds in two years. And how many calories do you think is in Cheesecake Factory's fried mac and cheese? Probably 565. It's actually 1,669 grams of fat. You could actually save 12 grams of the fat and half the calories if you simply ate an entire stick of butter. That is so bad. Thank you very much. Yep. Yet when New York City required most chain restaurants to print calorie counts on their menus, 90% of diners said their foods had more calories than expected, and 82% changed what they order. So if ignorance is bliss, perhaps knowledge is willpower. Ben Tracy, CBS News, Los Angeles. Yikes. And that's the CBS Evening News for tonight. I'm Katie Couric. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you tomorrow. Good night.